So dapagliflozin was recently studied in a pretty landmark trial and the data was discussed in the last few uh, national meetings. And it's come into uh, pretty wide consideration because not only was it considered as a diabetes drug, when it was first studied there were these cardiovascular benefits and it really asked the question of could dapagliflozin have additional benefits even without diabetes. And it's an interesting intersection of primary care and cardiology. Um, you know, many of us in our training, we all do uh, internal medicine, but as we go into subspecialties, our paths sometimes diverge. And it's drugs like this that really bring us back together to think about how all our illnesses are really related to each other. You know, I just alluded to the fact earlier that heart failure and diabetes really go hand in hand. And now we really have a drug that is targeting these therapies and then building from that. So, you know, I think the data was very compelling. We definitely see that uh, both in diabetic patients and non-diabetic patients who had heart failure with ejection fraction uh, that was reduced less than 40 percent with symptomatic disease, so their New York Heart Association class 2, 3, 4. So this is targeting a real-world population that we see in our practices all the time and offering a new pathway of therapy. Uh, I do think it's important to highlight that this data is compelling, but it's on the background of existing guideline-directed medical therapy. So this is not to underscore at all the value of what's already out there. It's very important that we continue to advocate for our patients to be on the best tolerated doses of beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, um, where appropriate aldosterone antagonism, where appropriate Entresto, uh, which is a angiotensin receptor blocker with a neprilocin inhibitor combination. So it's important to think about all those therapies first. They are very valuable, have incredible mortality and morbidity benefit. But I think at the practical level, we are gonna have to decide how do we apply all these therapies to our heart failure patients. So the study showed that you can improve heart failure related hospitalizations and mortality and morbidity, which I think is incredibly important to have that kind of hard endpoint. But now we have to move forward in thinking about how do we add this to our patient's care? Who are the right candidates? I don't think it will be the right choice for everyone. But for our patients and primary care practices and cardiology practices where we see reduced heart function, where we see diabetes, can be a very appropriate add-on therapy to improve outcomes. And for non-diabetic patients who have heart failure, for the right profile, which may mean those who have a bit more difficulty with volume management, uh, there may be additional benefit in adding this therapy on because we didn't see a lot of hypoglycemia or side effects. So the fact that it was initially developed as a diabetes drug doesn't raise red flags that it will be dangerous in heart failure patients. We don't fully understand the mechanism by which it's helping uh, cardiovascular events and heart failure. There's some thought that in that the way the drug works as a glucosuric, we are actually losing fluid. So that may be one way in which we're helping our patients uh, sort of decrease that cardiac stretch and have better outcomes in heart failure. So I think the data is compelling. It is likely to be a class effect for SGLT2 inhibitors. And I think it's really exciting to be able to have this tool in our toolkit for treating heart failure. And one that really spans across you know, internal medicine, you know, really uniting those of us who are in primary care in endocrinology and in cardiology, all really together to have a drug that might have multiple benefits. I think we really like to see that in future pharmacologic therapies where we're really able to address more than one condition. Our patients take so many medications as is.